to the first public trustee community forum. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout and we really appreciate you giving us your busy time. So thank you very much for coming. I'd like, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land on which we meet today, the Jarawa peoples, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also want to extend my acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present uh, today. As part of the guardianship system, I would like to recognise the traditional guardians who for many thousands of years provided peace of mind and care to those in need. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. And through our customer first agenda, the public trustee has made a commitment to providing community education to Queenslanders to make informed decisions that meet the needs about their financial futures. Uh, this includes community education sessions, programs and resources delivered across the state to support increased knowledge uh, and an understanding regarding advanced life planning, uh, processes and support available to Queenslanders. Uh, we aim at the Public Trustee to educate Queenslanders to take action to protect themselves and their loved ones from elder abuse. We do this by supporting um, Queenslanders to navigate life processes so they can make informed and empowered decisions along those they trust. So, um, so these community forums indicate that we take a place-based approach to localised issues um, because that leads to the best outcomes for the entire community. Um, we focus on local needs, uh, local solutions and the unique attributes of, of the relevant place or region. Uh, this regional community forum here in Toowoomba is the first in a series of forums being held across Queensland. Now these forums are intended um, as an opportunity to share and learn from the insights from key community leaders on preventing elder abuse and to explore how best to support and protect our Queenslanders. I'm very pleased to say that the highly respected professionals um, that are here with us today represent the frontline response to elder abuse in your community. And it was also my community. I am a former Toowoomba resident and I was a local graduate of the university as well. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so in Toowoomba, Delta Abuse Prevention Unit annual data noted a 21.3% um, um, spike in elder abuse hotline calls. Now this, need, this indicates a need to draw on the wisdom of this community, of all of you, including your knowledge and perspectives of the existing prevalence of elder abuse. Uh, we also need to explore what further can be done to prevent elder abuse and support and, and the supports that can be offered to further promote the rights of older people. Now, joining us today, I'm very pleased to say, uh, are, uh, are some key experts in, in the field of elder abuse and in the local community. So we might um, begin by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Cathy Reeves. Um, um, Dr. Reeves is a University of Southern Queensland lecturer specialising in family law, particularly uh, the role of family law in the instances of abuse or exploitation, such as child abuse, domestic and family violence and elder abuse. Uh, Dr. Reeves um, attended the University of Southern Queensland earning her Bachelor of Commerce uh, and subsequent Juris Doctor. Um, Dr. Reeves um, is a management committee member with the Inala Community Legal Centre, co-organiser of the USQ Vulnerable Persons Conference, which aims to draw on the um, vulnerabilities of at-risk individuals in various settings. And, uh, and she's also the Academic Integrity Officer for the USQ School of Law and Justice. Um, at the university, uh, Dr. Reeves lectures family, in family law studies, concentrating on the areas of family law, child protection, uh, domestic violence and research projects and dissertations. She has completed her PhD dealing with legal considerations and policy recommendations afforded to self-represented individuals within the jurisdiction of the Queensland Child Protection Courts. Would you all please welcome Dr. Cathy Reeves.
thanks very much. I um, appreciate everyone attending today, and in particular, I'd like to thank um, the public trustee for asking me to attend and speak, as well as my co-presenters. Um, I like being the first speaker because I get to set the tone, <laughs> make everyone feel comfortable. Um, I, I have to say I'm going to refer to my notes a bit because as a lecturer, I like to go off script. So it's best that I have only a certain amount of time to speak, so I'm going to try to stay on topic. Um, so I would like to hopefully get this right. Oh, I went too far. It was acknowledgement of country. I know that this has been undertaken, but I would like to respectfully state that both myself and USQ would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. We would also like to pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And today, what I'm talking about is all about respect, and so it should be shown. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the recommendations from the Australian Law Reform Commission report into protecting the rights of older Australians from abuse. We need to ask ourselves, who are the vulnerable? The elderly should not be considered vulnerable merely due to their age, although some facts commonly are associated with age that can bring this into light. So, for instance, disability. Uh, it's probably the most common among the, among the elderly. More than 80% of people aged 85 years or over have some form of disability. Cognitive and mental impairment also increases with age. From the age of 65, the prevalence of domestic, uh, sorry, the prevalence of dementia doubles every five or six years, um, and in some cases, much quicker than that. 30% of people aged over 85 currently have dementia. More generally, people aged 85 and over need significantly more assistance and care than those in the ages of 65 to 84. But we need to know that vulnerability is not just in those intrinsic factors such as health, um, cognitive impairments, but it's also from social or structural factors such as isolation and community attitudes toward the elderly. These factors, while not definitive, do in fact contribute to elder abuse. So dignity, autonomy, and safeguarding. So everyone wants to feel safe, they want to feel secure, but they also want to feel free. Elder abuse tends to undermine that dignity and autonomy for individuals. It can inhibit a person's ability to make choices about their own lives and to pursue what they value. As we get older, it doesn't mean that we should be releasing that freedom. Sometimes protective measures may conflict with a person's auto autonomy. So for example, where an older person may refuse to accept support or they may not want to report the abuse to police, especially when family members are involved. So like most adults, they prize their freedom and their independence, and they don't want to be treated like children or sheltered. They should be provided this respect, except in limited cases where there is particularly serious abuse and that protection should be given. So I also want to say there are more than just elderly that are at risk. We need to be safeguarding adults at risk. So not all older persons will meet the definition of being at risk. Poor physical or mental health conditions such as dementia and those societal factors such as isolation will make some people more vulnerable and less able to protect themselves. But being an at-risk at adult should capture all adults, not just the elderly. It needs to capture those who are vulnerable, not just those over the age of 65. For example, most people over 65 are not particularly vulnerable. Not every case of people over the age of 65 have experienced abuse or are at risk. However, some people under that age will need services. Further, to set an age threshold, so for example, 65 years of age, I mean, I think from a um, getting closer to that age, I think retirement is fantastic. 
but setting that as an uh, age threshold for abuse is um, not particularly in the best interest of individuals. So for example, it would, it would really seem perverse to say that a 64 year old with advanced dementia or a serious physical disability would not have access to safeguarding services, while someone who may be 66 or 70 that has the full capacity and has the ability to make those decisions um, and they have no physical limitations, they should still be able to make um, their own decisions and have the freedom to do so. And I'm going to give you a for instance, I noticed that before we had a bit of a problem with the slides. Um, I note that due to COVID and other uh, factors, this uh, forum was going to be in March, but unfortunately I was not going to be able to attend because I lost my sister. My sister was 57 years old when she passed. My sister had been married three times and the first two um, were very abusive. And I say abusive to the point where she had an acquired brain injury, which became uh, more prevalent and she ended up with Lewy body dementia, which ended up being the reason she died. So in this instance, that would be an adult at risk that was not elderly, but it was from abuse. Um, <clears throat> So at-risk adults really should include those who need care and support, those that are being abused or neglected, that are at risk of being abused and neglected, and cannot protect themselves from abuse. In particularly serious cases, however, the safety of an at-risk person may need to be secured even against their wishes. And of course, all those, although we do want that consent, we should be seeking that consent but they may not be able to be contacted, they may not be able to give that consent, that is when we should then take that next step. While we want to give them their dignity, they need to be able to have that mental capacity to say yes or no, but we need to step in when they can't. Abuse can be an assault on a person's dignity. I mean, you look at physical and sexual assault, financial assault, these are clear cases, but neglect and psychological and social abuse also show a marked disrespect for a person's dignity. We need to attempt to strike a balance. A set of principles should be included in safeguarding that emphasize respecting those persons that have been abused. And I promise that is not my phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in striking that balance, we need to ensure that they have the right to refuse support for assistance or protection. That doesn't mean that we don't keep an eye on it though. We need to balance the respect for the person's right to make their own decisions about their care and it must be a matter of respect. However, there are many at-risk individuals that face that imbalance and we must respect those rights as well as personal autonomy, self-sufficiency and privacy but in some limited cases, it's appropriate to act without their consent. Now, I, I know that my time is coming short, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So issues surrounding elder abuse relate to areas of Commonwealth, state and territory and possibly local government responsibility. I wanted to throw that in because we are in the council library. Um, at the Commonwealth level, legislation in the areas of aged care, superannuation, social security and veterans entitlements is of particular relevance as we age. State and territory jurisdictions, legislation re relating to substitute decision making, guardianship, retirement, villages, wills and probates affects the population as it ages, um, as we all know. Criminal matters such as fraud and other forms of financial abuse are also dealt with at the state and territory level, although at times Commonwealth legislation can cover certain criminal matters. There are currently no specific laws in Australia dealing with what might be broadly classed as elder abuse. There are, however, a range of types of conduct that might be described as elder abuse, and I note that uh, Jody will be discussing these with you. So what are the recommendations? We need to be looking at at risk. It should be defined to mean people over the age of 18 and over who have care and support needs. 
um, be being abused or neglected, at risk of abuse or neglect, unable to protect themselves from that abuse or neglect because of those needs. Adult safeguarding laws should provide the consent of an at-risk adult, and it must be secured before taking any other action. We need to retain their dignity, their, um, their freedom. But when they can't consent, that's where it should not be required, that consent. So it might be in serious cases of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect, and various uh, types of abuse that I know that Jody will be speaking to. If the safeguarding agency cannot contact the adult, it might be that they've been kind of shied away somewhere by family members, etc. And despite any efforts, contact needed. Um, if you can't make that contact, we need to step in, consent not being required. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, if they lack the legal capacity to give that consent in the circumstances, someone should step in on their behalf. So I want to take um, the time to say thank you for you all attending. Um, that's me. Thank you, Kathy, and um, great adaptation of uh, technological um, <laughs> management. So great job. Um, so, and I'd also like to just acknowledge, you know, the importance of involving. Um, the client or, or, or the individual in the decision-making process. And I know that's something at the public trustee we take seriously. In, um, in the last uh, 18 months, we've implemented uh, a key uh, program called uh, Structured Decision-Making. Uh, we're the first jurisdiction to do so, and we partnered with Professor Sue Rigby from La Trobe University as part of that. And it's a best practice decision-making model for our sector and it involves uh, seven key steps. And one of the key um, uh, steps is um, uh, consulting with the customer before making a decision. And, and for us, it's a really vital step to ensure that customers are involved in the decision-making step. And we encourage all agencies uh, to do that as well. So thank you for, for that important point. Cool Wayne Fossey was born in Gubby Gubby, Gubby Country, located in Nambour, at Nambour. He is an elder for Gold Coast and um, hinterland areas and also the University of Southern uh, Queensland across, across Stanthorpe, Toowoomba, Ipswich and Springfield campuses, as well as chairing the um, University's uh, Elders and Values Persons Advisory Committee, which I advised earlier, which oversees research into Aboriginal community development in the Toowoomba region. Uncle Wayne is also the Vice President of the Banya People's Aboriginal Corporation. I don't think Uncle Wayne sleeps, so that's what I'm, <laughs> um, that's what I'm sensing. Um, please welcome Uncle Wayne Fossey. Uh, Jingri, everybody. Jingri Wallawalu, Bajra Budjara, which in Yugambir is refers to you. Welcome. Hi, how are you going? Uh, and it also means how you're feeling, which means how you're feeling on the gut. Uh, many Aboriginal groups, including mine, distinguish between what the brain does and what the gut does. And I think recently we've just come to the same conclusion across Western medicine that we have this gut instinct. So the gut instinct that I'm going to refer to today is really about the nature of elder abuse with a social perspective. And I thank Cathy for all of the all of the work and the expertise and the backup I know behind the scenes that I've heard that you've given to individuals. To acknowledge country, this is not my country, my country is Yugambia country, and through Gugajan, through Dad's side in the north. What I would say to you, it's very important not to get lost in the age-old sort of things that you see that become very trite. You know, things like, well, we're gonna, you know, people have walked here before, elders, past, present, and engaging. The key thing is to realise that this is land which belongs in my time, because I knew those people at the Jeromes, to this is Jarrell land, right? I will take that on with anybody any day of the week. That's how I was brought up with my father and my grandfather here. My grandfather lived here in 1904 out of what was called the Middle Ridge, which is where the blackfellas lived in those days and where the Chinese lived because it was beyond Boundary Road. So if you came into town before six o'clock or if you were here at five o'clock, uh, after five o'clock, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're really in trouble. So I come from a footsteps on this country through the generations of my family. 
it's very important we now talk about different names, Indigenous First Nations, etc., etc. And uh, it depends, in my case, it really depends on the people. And that's why I thought it was really important for me today to, to not do a PowerPoint. I thank Cathy for hers and others, but it's really important to do the fact that you, you do tend to look on a face that has pale skin, the fact that, you know, I rolled my sleeves up, taken my suit coat off, you know, I'm here, for, not just because it's hot in this room, but <laughs> I'm here to make sure that we have some sort of approach where I have personally been involved with families, with kids, and also with the elders that have been in all of those processes over time. It's not just a matter of dealing with the elders who, who may be there. I would say to you, really, and I've just put, a, put down a series of headings, and if it's possible, like, put at a later date in the next few weeks, I will draw these out into some sort of, you know, a couple of pages of paper, which will have some impact, uh, I hope, across the system from our perspective. So there's been a lot of research done, and that research has tended to fade over time in terms of Aboriginal stuff that have affected us in elder years, mainly in Tasmania and especially in South Australia. So the South Australian stuff is probably part of it. So the shirt that I've got on today, instead of the usual plastic shirt that we wear, uh, <laughs> Charlie knows what it's like on a plastic shirt, uh, is learning community. So I had the chance to be involved around Australia in the, uh, working with QUT in 179 different locations in Australia. So I had the red dust, not just the torn the red dirt on the boots, but I had red dust, I had rainforests, I had islands, I had all sorts of things. Incredible way to live your life. But an amazing opportunity showed me that elder abuse is hidden and elder abuse is much greater, much, much, much greater than what we anticipate. My interpretation often is also the further you go west, uh, it, it becomes more hidden, more enclosed, a lot of younger people are involved in humbugging in communities. I've worked in the Kimberleys, I've worked across uh, the Territory, for example, Tasmania. It's there, but it's a matter of how hidden is it. And it is the silent epidemic that, that really is around in so many different ways. Sadly, that silent epidemic, in my opinion, is, is on the increase, and we get lots of things where people would phone me up. I've had two today. Right now, I didn't. I'm, I'm driving from the Gold Coast <laughs> to a meeting at seven o'clock, and then to Ipswich for a, a, a thing I had to do, and then out to USQ to see somebody very quickly and to hear. And you know, I sadly answered my phone. Yes, it was Bluetooth, but um, I managed to answer my phone and go through that process. And it was really about a community thing. What can you do about? It? Can you tell me? You know that sort of stuff. And that's where Charlie gets involved, right? Charlie, Charlie's the face of dealing with those men's groups and so forth in Toowoomba. And he cops it from all sorts of directions. And often it's very hard to know to go into those families to give a solution or into that community to give a solution. The police and other advisors and services are in exactly the same situation. You go so far and then you think, how the hell do we go to the next step? That's the challenge to be able, able to do it. So a community elder in Aboriginal terms is the capital E. It really is the word elder. It's got nothing to do with age. It's, it's got to do with the person who has the ability to be able to support, to help, to modify, to change, to, to negotiate. And we talk about how many spears in Wayne's back. There's quite a few uh, from events that didn't work out or people who disagree with me. Uh, and you've got to work your way through that. And we do that with every job. We do that in our families. We do it in every way. But when you do it at a community level, as Charlie knows, it gets to be a bit more challenging sometimes. In the Aboriginal picture, it's also about history, it's about songlines, it's about culture. And what I'd like to do is to acknowledge the power of this landscape. That's as important as the people who've walked upon it because we come, we go, we come from the dust, we return back to it. We won't be here. Yes, we do have elders. Yes, we do have elders who we show respect for, but we need to show the respect also, not just in a general acknowledgement, but for all those who've stepped foot on this country before then. People like Charlie, who are the current generations of people who are doing it. You go to Kanamala and you'll end up with another Charlie, don't we? <laughs> he's, the, he's the man for the town, has been there for them. And different places, these people provide the leadership in elder abuse and other areas, and they're very, very important. Uh, your husband, Mark, has also provided exceptional leadership from outside the Aboriginal community into this community. And, and Mark Copeland's uh, advice needs to be well and truly respected. So, look, as First Nations, there are many, many things that we can, we can talk about. What I'm seeing, and this is just a quick picture, um, and give me, give me the wind-up in a minute. Uh, it, it's about often younger perpetrators of elder abuse that I'm seeing more and more. Kids that are coming up that I would call humbugging. Grandparents, you know, I want your card, I want your pin, I want this, I want that. 
we're dealing with people often who are still working like me in bank books, and, no, not quite working in bank books, but bank books and paper. There's a paper generation versus the digital generation. And the digital generation is preying upon the technology and the changes that are there. And preying upon the businesses that I see. And you look at the case against Telstra in Central Australia, and you'll have a look and see all those examples. Uh, and people being sold mobile phones, <laughs> no telephone reception at all. If you've been to Central Australia, I've been involved with Larrakia and, uh, and the same thing. It's just sad, it's so sad. Uh, there's really poor social and emotional wellbeing support in many of our communities. Aboriginal people want to keep it within the family in many cases, keep it within the community, keep it closed, keep this doorway. And how do you do that? And you come in and you want to help and you can see the help being required. And it's like, mm, how do we jump that fence? You know, and uh, it's like people like me that usually would do something like this. I would say, if you're going to talk about native titles, a lot of black fellas were here, leave it at the front door. I don't want to talk about it here. It's not, this is not the place. But elder abuse needs to be talked about. You know, we, we see so much chatter about other things like native title. Elder abuse also is different across our communities. So you cannot compare Kanamala, which I know quite well. I was at St George the other day in Durham Bandy. You can't compare those two places, even though they may be nearby, or the little town of Hebel in between. You know, they, they're all different. They're really different. So here, there's a big difference, one hell of a difference between how the treatment occurs in Toowoomba compared from Blackfellas' point of view, Aboriginal point of view, John Big Boy, um, uh, to compare to Pittsworth or Allara or Warwick or Stanthorpe. It's different, right? And I know those communities are coming from my family. There's a small knowledge that's where people are trying to help, right? And it's, it's really hard to know what to do to break down how far we go and how far we support. What I think is hard to do if you're not part of those communities is to understand the community tensions those tensions are there and the relationships and the family interactions and the historical stuff. And sometimes that leadership can be provided by Charlie coming in. I'll use Charlie as an example, seeing his significant smile on his face. Uh, but the Charlie type person, the, the champion of Aboriginal people in the local area, but you can't break his back as well. So the services need to reflect the nature of the support. We get some great police. I, I've got a house in Logan. So, you know, today I come from Logan, which is Yugambia country, across the Yagara country, Jagara country, Yugapur country, and back on the Jarrah country. And they're all languages. So it's how people communicate within the families, the structures, and the communities that people like the champions, like, like Charlie, will give you. I think it's important to know what that community is, right? And that's hard. So you often need to go back to key community members. You need to know the tensions. You need to know how the community will provide and cope with its own solutions. They're very different. So Kanamala cannot be compared to Pittsburgh, I can assure you of that. And so you need to know who you're dealing with. There's also a fear about somebody owning your business. So what we're seeing often is if you go to Kanamala, you'll, you'll find that everybody knows everybody's business, or they think they do in Kanamala, right? There's nobody from Kanamala here, so I'm probably reasonably <laughs> safe. And the, the spears are not in my back. But the reality is that that's it, because they, they want to be covert in terms of being able, able to do that to protect themselves. And that, that's fair enough. But people do know, you know when they're reaching out for help. You do know when you do that. And police are often in the most difficult circumstance. Uh, it's the same as the DV circumstance in many circumstances that I've, I've been involved in. I get called into quite a few. People fear of being judged, right? They fear as an individual, oh God, I'm not a good grandma. That's the most typical one that I get. I'm not a good grandfather. Don't get that as often enough, wish it was. Uh, as an individual, you know, they fear, I'm not a good mum. I'm not, not a person who's able, able to do that. Oh, yes, I've done a lousy job. I'm not a good parent at, at all that time. With, the shame that is there from an Aboriginal community is not just related to elder abuse. It's a shame that's related to, oh, geez, I've got no money to put petrol in the car. It's the fact that I can't get transport. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't feed my kids properly. I can't get my kids to the doctor, or the doctor in my town only comes here, or the dentist only comes once a month. You know, and I see all of that sort of stuff. So I'm really fearful. And somebody's taking my money that I've got and sharing it around. And we know that the Centrelink processes and the centre pay processes need some revision. We also, and uh, to sort of draw it to some sort of conclusion, the family obligations can be both positive and negative. 
where people feel that it's, um, you know, you must give it to me, Aunty. You must. It, it's your job to give it to me. And fear of violence is there. Definite violence uh, that I've seen. I've often seen it in the streets. You know, you've only got to stand in some remote community. It's outside, outside Centrelink and actually see the money go from being a digital thing to a real thing and then broken up with a dogfight going on in the front, front ground. So one of the things that I just sort of finish on, I think it needs a, probably a campaign against the, the nature of what it is for us as well. So I know I've helped out in the Kimberley crew and um, we, we did a thing saying, it's a shame, it's a shame job, you know, to use our sort of languages that we use in community. It's a shame job if you take money off your, off your elders. It's a shame job, don't do it. Secondly, the boys use the word, it's a dog job. You've dogged them to be able to do that. You've actually taken that and you've destroyed the nature of it. Be ashamed of yourself. Be able to see yourself as a man or see yourself as a woman. Taking that off that old lady or taking that on the street or taking that from somebody is no good at all. It really is bad. So there's each person that you deal with is an individual. Right? And that's the hard thing sometimes to do. So look, I thought I'd, I'd bring it to a conclusion by saying look, this thing that looks a bit grubby sitting on your seat is a bunion nut. And the purpose of a bunion nut is it part of the gathering? So the gatherings happen normally every three years on the Bunyas, but every year as well, and thousands of people. So if you want to have a look at the white record for Dolby, 12,500 people were recorded on Jimbo Homestead going on to the Bunyas from the, from the three sides. That's a hell of a lot of people. 4,000 odd people walking through the streets of Dolby, or the edge of Mile Creek, if you know that. It is Dolby at the moment. Mile Creek is the town, I think. I think it's rich to town. I mean, I was there the other day. And what you find is that two people were shot on the way through. Now, they were going to get these. They weren't trying to invade Dolby when the population of Dolby was only 435. But what I'd say to you is that this is really important. So this thing that looks rather grubby, I've left it in its grubby format as it comes off the big bunion. And the reason I've left it like that, if you want to plant it, you can, right? And give it a go. Plants sort of so that it plants like that in, in the ground. And the, the life is still being given to that thing once you soak it again, right? Or you can break it all off and make a mess on the floor like I'm going to do. And you'll actually get the nut. Don't eat that. The nut's inside it. <laughs> and I'm not going to attempt to look tough and break it off with my fingernails. But you can eat, eat that nut at that stage. It's preferably roasted. The reason I bought this today is this is a giving thing. And when you're on Carby Country Country, and I know the auntie who does the, the bunions at the Carby Carby Company, which we have some interesting challenges with. Uh, but we believe this is the spirit of giving. This is the spirit of giving food. This becomes your makeup, right, for women. It gives you that shiny look, that Kardashian shine. Uh, it does all sorts of things. It is the healthiest little part of the process to be able, able to do so. So I give those to you in the best of spirit in terms of moving on from the situations that we've got. It's a giving thing that's very important. I think what you all can give is the power of something like this, something which is there. And if you give somebody something a bit more three-dimensional, uh, you know, paper's great. Uh, it's the one, no wonder people like gifts and things, is it? You know, they're like, oh, they're great. We've got, we've got a free whatever, uh, the sample bag that is. Uh, but it's important that this is our sample bag. And it's just a little reminder that really giving and connection is the most important part. And if you connect, you'll actually reduce the rate of elder abuse. You'll see it rise, I think, initially, quite, probably quite sharply, and then it will decrease. But I think it's also up to our mob to really put the shame factor back into the fact that we are humbugging people, to use that language, or we are taking from people, we are destroying people's lives, both their physical, emotional and mental health. Yep, thank you. I think I know who this is. No, you know what? So uh, thank you very much, Uncle Wayne, and I think um, um, we knew that the issue of elder abuse was complex, um, very um, uh, often involving family dynamics, and I think the social and the cultural aspects add another dimension. And I think the suggestion of um, giving is really important to address that issue of isolation, <coughs> which research after research has indicated is one of the major causes. So thank you, um, Uncle Wayne. Um, so it is now uh, my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, the Public Trustee Regional Director, Jodie Curry. Uh, Jodie brings with her a wealth of local community knowledge and understanding, uh, has worked with the Public Trustee for 21 years across various regions, 
Uh, she is passionate about supporting regional Queensland communities and bolstering local responses to communities' needs. Um, Jodie brings uh, with uh, it comes with her own lived experience of the impact of uh, mental health and disability in, in her own family, which has inspired her um, to continue um, and uh, to, to fight for and ensure greater inclusion for older people, people living with a disability, and those with an experience of ill uh, mental health along with supporting their families. Would you please welcome Jodie Curry. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Um, Wayne, I think I just want to pick up on a point there that you did mention about, um, you know, every community is different and having worked around various regions of the public trustee, every community is different and the community of Toowoomba is also different. It is unique in in its um, circumstances, so it's not a one-size-fits-all for everybody. So today, I'm just going to talk about um, the different types of elder abuse. Um, so there is financial abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, and also physical abuse. Part of our role, I'm going to focus on the financial abuse because as financial administrators, that's the area that we see very regularly in our roles. So final financial abuse, what could it be? Could be forcing an um, elderly person, even your mum and dad, to sign over property or assets. It could be misusing or taking an elderly person's money or their credit cards or even their debit cards. It could be using undue influence or deception to change the terms of an elderly person's will or enduring power of attorney. Um, and it could all be also be forging an elderly person's signature. So some of the behavioural signs that we, I suppose, see quite regularly through our role um, can be some sudden or radical changes in behaviour. It could also be fear of someone close to them. Um, so when you're in having an interview or a meeting with them, um, you might sense that. I think, Wayne, you mentioned gut. Your gut in instinct um, usually comes into play there. There could also be irritability, shaking, trembling or they're crying, um, which could be out of character. Depression, social withdrawal. So again, that isolation um, and talking of suicide. There could be a lack of interest um, in getting involved in their usual interests, um, so like going to craft or something, um, to the social activities in the retirement village um, where they may live. It could also be changes to sleep patterns or eating patterns. Um, presenting as helpless or hopeless or sad. Um, contradicting statements not associated with that mental confusion. And also the reluctance to talk openly. It could be also deferring to another person. So again, you could be having a, a interview or a meeting with that person and they're constantly looking over at the other person to make sure what they're saying is actually the right words. And it could also be that warrant, um, worry or anxiety and it could be for no apparent reason. So what I have today to share with you guys is just some local case studies of two matters that we have in the Toowoomba region. So it actually shows that it is happening in our community, whether we want it to be happening or not. Um, so case study one is around a female adult um, in her late 70s, um, was diagnosed with dementia and enters aged care. Family were appointed as a financial administrator. Family were then removed after there were discrepancies um, with within and around the financial components. So at that stage, the public trustee was appointed as administrator. Um, part of our role is to investigate um, various financial transactions. So in this particular matter, we, we commenced a bit of a investigation into the financial transactions and the increase in debt. So the customer came to us with uh, an ever increasing debt. The customer 
On the face of it, it looked like she was property rich, but she had very little cash, so she was so cash poor. The family occupied the house and had occupied the house for a long time. There was no financial contribution from the family to any of the household expenses. And there was also non-Centrelink reporting. So ultimately that resulted in a huge Centrelink debt. There was also non-payment of nursing home fees or the nursing home bond, which again, large nursing home debt. And also the access to the adult's bank account. Um, she had no access for her own personal use. So decision was made to sell the property um, as that was the only asset, to be able to pay the nursing home fees, pay the Centrelink debt to make sure she can continue to get her, her income and also secure her, her accommodation. I suppose through that investigation, a lot of the words that we heard was, well, this is the family home, we can't sell it. Oh, we borrow money all the time from each other. That's just how it was in our family. I borrowed off mum, I paid for this, mum paid for that. Um, so it's hearing and listening for those types of words. I suppose how we worked with this one was we discussed the options around whether the family could purchase the property, you know, what options were available to the family to be able to relocate to another home. Um, and also had a look to see, well, did they fit that protected person um, avenue as well? So we worked very closely. So again, you know, I think Sam A touched on it and Kathy also touched on it, the structured decision making. So again, in collaboration with the family and the customer, um, working on options and solutions that were available. At the forefront of our mind though, was the customer and, and securing her accommodation. So it took over two years to resolve that matter with about two, with the property being sold. Um, it did require decisions around, you know, do we need to evict this person and do we need to make application and, and how would the adult, would the adult want us to do that? I suppose the reason why I, I put that case study in there was it was more financial abuse. So there was no physical abuse, love, love their family, you know? but elder abuse can come in different forms. Case study two was around um, the public trustee being appointed for a couple. Um, the adult children, so conflict within the family, adult children launched the application um, due to concerns that um, other family were attempting to transfer the, um, the uh, couple's property. Again, very little cash assets, and they were living off overdraft. The family resided on the couple's property in a granny flat, and there were multiple attempts to try and sell that property um, without success. Each time we consulted and attempted to sell the property, we were faced with an increase in aggression. The adult so in consultation with our adult and our, our couple, um, they raised concerns of signing paperwork that they didn't know what they'd signed. Um, they didn't understand and they actually felt they were threatened to sign. Other signs that we saw in that particular matter was solicitors acting for the family actually said they were um, helping to refinance consolidate all the debt for the family. They also waived independent legal advice and they didn't use the couple's normal solicitor that, that the couple have always used. They went to a different solicitor. There was also promises made. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna transfer the property but they can live there and we're gonna pay them this much money a week and, and then we'll pay all their nursing home fees when that time comes. Again, looking at the medical evidence, it did support there was capacity issues with this matter. Um, and there was also documented concerns around the financial abuse. 
Issues were unravelling around the witnessing of the documents. Um, so most of the documents were witnessed by family. Um, so there wasn't again that separation there for that. And there were also unaccounted transactions from the bank account with loans written next to it. The couple were also guarantors for other loans for the family. Um, and through out, I suppose, making those inquiries, there were then, I suppose, when you put pressure on to get that information and gather that information, we were then receiving various bills for the couple that the couple had to pay for. So I suppose with that one, it was a lot more challenging. Um, it you know, involved lawyers, but again, it was a very clear cut in, in the sense of the customers were pushed into um, potentially um, financial transactions that weren't in their best interest. So some of the key tips that we can um, encourage to help prevent financial elder abuse is ultimately having a will, have an enduring power of attorney and also an advanced health directive. Seek independent legal advice around your will and your enduring power of attorney. And also include detailed directions in your enduring power of attorney around such decisions that you would like if you had lost that capacity. For example, where you would prefer to live. Um, in that, you can also have other types of decisions, especially in the Toowoomba region where um, you know there are a lot of out west farming families and farming families again um, uncle Wayne Fossey pointed out are unique they're case by case one size does not fit all choose two people that you can trust to act in your best interest and also ensure any loans are legally binding the other thing we can do is also help educate um, our communities around knowing their rights. What are their rights? Where can they go? Um, so know that their rights around their adequate standard of living um, does include foodie, food and clothing. The highest possible standard of physical and mental health. The right to be safe and free from violence. Be free from cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment. Privacy and their family life. And again, it ties into um, their human rights. Some of the statements that you can hear and, and most probably you have heard through through your own careers is that, um, you know, they might make statements around, um, lost my, lost my thing. they might make statements around, um, you know, what's mine is mine, what's yours is mine. Um, I suppose in the rights for all decision making, I suppose, you know, there are some of those, it's going to be my money someday anyway. Um, I do deserve this as I do so much care work for them. Um, but they want to treat me and, and they want to give that to me anyway. Um, and I suppose that was coined by Dr. Sarah Russell in the early inheritance syndrome. So again, I know through my career, I don't know how many times I've heard these types of situations. And it does, it has massive ramifications financially for a customer um, or for a person with a, of, uh, of any age that is under that undue influence or that abuse, because um, it does affect their sentiment it you know, might put them into a position where they've got large debts or puts their current accommodation at risk. And then that puts, again, their own anxiety and stress on them. And no, I missed one. Sorry, I have a question. <laughs> That's okay. Um, oh, one back from that, I think, is it still? 
Um, I have one that has the different helplines that are available. So you have got the Elder Abuse Helpline, um, you've got 1800 Elder Help and Lifeline. And I do see that we've got um, a member from TASC um, here. And I know for the local community in Toowoomba, I've referred quite a lot of people um, to, to TASC um, where they can potentially go and get some independent advice or, or support. Jody and, and also I think linking in you know, a lot of those uh, issues and concerns you raise um, does also link in what um, occurs with our First Nations peoples in terms of some of those risks and also with Dr Kathy Reeves advised that it's not necessarily limited to older uh, persons per se. I think um, those type of risks can occur uh, to any individual so thank you very much. Um, so, look, thank you to all of our experts. Um, so now we have some time for questions. So if I can ask all of our wonderful speakers to come and sit out the front as we start throwing lots of questions at, at yourself. And, um, uh, and while uh, we do that, um, I invite uh, all of you to ask uh, any questions you may have of your experts uh, uh, and of us, and, and we're very happy to answer them and we'll start off, I suppose I might ask the first question and uh, the first question is um, to uh, perhaps yourself, Uncle Wayne, um, uh, from um, your perspective, um, um, in terms of um, our First Nations people's enormous respect generally for their older, um, for their elders. Uh, do you think that the broader community has something to learn in terms of um, how they engage and how they support um, older Queenslanders um, from, um, uh, in terms of how they should engage and deal with uh, older Queenslanders given um, you know, the learnings we can get from other cultures? Yeah, look, I, sorry, I was a little bit hesitant to sit down because it looks like we've got, you know, the girls yeah. on the side of the board. <laughs> um, and that's all it was, sorry. Yeah. No segregation in this room. Uh, I think it's important to realise that historically, the role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was, was very different in terms of eldership. It was an eldership, and I know from my association, lots of people as a kid, Charlie's experience is probably similar. Um, you know, we were taught to behave we were taught to respect and often that knowledge was there and plus a lot of education was done by separating male from female okay so you learnt language by separating people out you learned about things boys went this way girls went that way like we're doing it at the moment uh, so it's, it's very similar to, to that sort of arrangement I, I think those barriers have been broken down by basically sort of the colonial impact but secondly by a huge range of Technology is a huge range of money in communities, a huge range of things about possessions, etc. And often they are the ones, they're the items that have got in, in the mess of trying to sort out what is society. So I think the number one answer is yes. In many of our communities, the role of eldership is exceptionally important. It's becoming more and more difficult and it's becoming more and more difficult that I see in terms of people. I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest person in this room, right? So I'm nearly 72. So in that process, I look at others, a person that uh, I had a phone call from this morning about their family, they are 52 with dementia, right? 52 and looking at what they're going to do. So actually, it's a perfect time to mention nothing just it. And in terms of, do you have a will? No, et cetera. So Wayne has this sort of little personal mental checklist of what he does. What I'd say to you is it's very important that the lessons are there, that if we look at maintaining that knowledge amongst people that are with it and able and capable of passing it on and supporting people in their community, you will get advice that is good across all communities, black, white or indifferent. But it's very important to make sure that you maintain it. So that's why I've made that comment about the sort of humbugging and uh, it's really a shameful act and it's, it's, it's really probably about time. Uh, I'm not, you know, as an ex-high school principal, I use the cane, I shouldn't say that publicly, but that was the day, those were the days. 
And, uh, but I think we need that sort of, not, not the cane, don't get me wrong, we're not in, <laughs> we're not in Southeast Asia or, or, um, or yeah, some of the Arab republics. But what I'd say to you is that very important is, is a concept that if you behave like that, there is a consequence. You know, this is a shameful act to take that money or that old woman in the street. And it is really important that you don't do it. And you are shamed, you are condemned, you are all sorts of things. And I've been one of those persons that have stood up, and I'm sure Charlie's, Charlie's done it as well. Just say to somebody, oh, God, what are you doing? How do you do that? And we need more people to do it. But we're afraid in today's litigious sort of word, world to, to say that. You know, like, don't touch her. <laughs> don't do this. Uh, it's, it's important to realise that we've just, we've got to stand up. And that's what I think we probably, the, the blackfellow mob that do stand up, we stand up probably stronger than other people in the community. So that's sort of an indirect answer, you know, that you get the narratives from people like me, sorry about that. No, but right. it's important to know that it's, it's a very individual act as well, but it's also that act of actually respecting old people. How many times did you go into a nursing home and you know, people will, will want to tell you about their history or about their dog or about their horse you know, in Toowoomba, I've met many good horses and photo horse photographs. You know, the wife has disappeared, but the horse is there. Uh, that's the sort of idea. Uh, but you'll find that it's very important to recognise the power of that communication and that one-on-oneness that is there, the appreciation of their history, of their family, and how they've developed that sort of stuff. They have often been out of sync with what I call the services that provide. That's why organisations like Carvel, you can't define what they, they do because they provide everything in bits and pieces, right? and they need more money to do it, but they, they don't just provide health, they provide you know, other sorts of information. So I think in, in our overall society, we tend into Toowoomba, and it's the same on the coast and otherwise, we have an agency to do this, right? Oh, it's not the police's job. You know, and I, yeah, I really do feel sorry to, for police, it's, it's such a hard task all, all of the time, because you've got to make those judgments in a short period of time. But we tend to think in terms of a white bureaucracy to be able to do it. And that this is not something that can be answered by the bureaucracy, it's something which can be answered by society. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Um, hey, there's just a relation to one of the last um, slides on your presentation, Jerry, with the early inheritance syndrome and this whole expectation that there is a, um, a, a ultimately a, a mentality that what is theirs is going to be mine in the eyes of the white man. And I know that, like from the data, that there's a lot of cases of this that are actually perpetrated within families. Um, you went through a couple of the signs that we could be looking out for, but I'm just wondering, obviously, where a sector organisation here, like we're looking at this from an organisational perspective, how can we actually be working as community organisations to be recognising and what steps should we be taking to, to I guess, address this? I suppose, yeah, yeah, on the fun, yeah don't have all the answers there, Eamon. Um, I think what we have to do as an organisation, and I'm thinking from, from our perspective, is the community network and the engagement there. Um, I think, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, um, I want to talk to some of the stakeholders that are here today on what can we do? How can we support them in their role on the front line um, to be able to either give the advice um, referral path pathway so we can then give options to the local community but I think it's it's all education and getting it out there that it's okay to raise those questions it's okay to ask it's okay to I suppose like Uncle Wayne Fossey said earlier trust your gut instinct there kind of thing um, and it's getting it out there to like everyday people so bank tellers because you know out of it especially around the elderly people, they still go into the banks. So who's going to tell whether there's a, a, a behavioural difference? A bank teller will if they're seeing Mary every day or every second day and then all of a sudden that changes, the, the transactions change on the financial side or the way that they used to dress um, has changed because they don't have access to money to actually buy the nice clothes that they used to once upon be able to do. So I think it's really getting that, that message out there into the community um, and, and how do we do that. And if I could just add on to that, um, first of all, I'll go back to Uncle Wayne, 
Oh my gosh, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> it's just inter so interesting um, listening about your culture and as you're talking, in the, and I'm sure everyone here to some degree is going, hey, I recognize that in my own life or have heard of an experience. I am from originally South Alabama in mm -hmm. the States and everything that you're saying, I'm going, oh my gosh, <laughs> was he at my home? Was he in my hometown? So um, thank you for that. And thank you to Jody because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself as we're talking about elders, when, um, again, I, um, my background is, uh, my PhD was in child protection and I'm thinking, what do we say to our children when they go out and about abuse, about, you know, uh, stranger danger? You know, these are the same things that we should be looking at in, with the elders and, um, you know, taking care of them and having that mandatory reporting for them as well. So uh, thank you both for that. Could I give one quick example? Sure. Uh, I've, I've worked at, um, um, in, the, in the US in the next door state for the Olympics in 96. And I'm trying to think of the name of the university I worked at. It was exactly that. And uh, I saw the most intriguing things. For example, uh, the community uh, had got together and decided we wanted to have, it was really hot, really hot, and really sweaty. And uh, the community had decided, well, how can we help out the elderly uh, in, a, in a poor area? Auburn it was, it was Auburn University. And, Did you uh, say Auburn? Auburn, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I'm an Alabama supporter, but that's yeah, yeah, we're talking it. college football. We'll talk, football. <laughs> we'll talk <laughs> flying wedge tails later, later, yeah, yeah. I had one land on my hand, I was like, oh my God, I've still got a scar, actually. Yeah, there's a scar. Uh, but it was interesting. The community decided it was really hot, really sweaty. The Olympic Games were on in, in uh, Atlanta up the road. And as a practical example, what happened was they said, OK, we're going to put a drink fridge, you know, big Coca-Cola, dirty great three-door drink fridge on Uncle Bob's veranda in, in, a, black, in a black community. And I was living um, in Lee Road out in the bush in a poor, poor community. Well, it was really good, except he didn't have power. So what they did, they did about 350 metres of power lead from somebody's house, right across the road where I drove every day, over a normal 240 type, well, 112 or whatever it is in the States, uh, every day. And that was their solution. The reason I say that is people come up with different solutions. That, uh, we, had a, we had a mutual friend who was getting humbugged because they thought he had money from the past, and, his solution, and he had a mobile phone, right? And he could work his mobile phone in his 70s. Uh, and as a result of that, Uncle um, said to me, um, can you go downtown, can you buy me a SIM card? And I said, oh, yeah, what sort of SIM card do you want? I ended up, he said, I want 10 of them. I go, what, what 10, seven, 10 SIM cards? So when people humbugged him and, and tried to get it, he would slip another SIM card. <laughs> They'd get the, the, like this number has been disconnected, right? <laughs> and so he figured it out very quickly. And when he passed, you know, part of the cleanup was, was you know, with more than one SIM card, he, he got 10 on this guy, 10 on this guy, 10 on this guy. So, you know, there's a big collection of probably 35, 30 SIM cards. Uh, a very cunning way to do it. So there's different practical techniques that I'd see community use in a, in a positive way to, to actually avoid the harassment, which is about financial harassment in most cases, but it, it's also just bugging them. Like if people come in and raid their fridge. Uh, I've had people uh, with a car, you know. I, I, this person drove me somewhere down to the sports club that one day, drove, drove back, and then I had one of his relatives come and say, I want your car. And I thought, you know, don't loan him your car. No, he wants it for good. <laughs> So it's, it's to that sort of point of view that he wanted a four-wheel drive and he didn't have a four-wheel drive and he wanted that four-wheel drive because he thought Uncle wasn't capable of doing so and it was going to be his one day anyway, exactly that they think. And your, your statements were spot on, you know, those, those, those three at the end. They really are so spot on that it, it, it's really going to be mine and I'm sure we all hear that on a regular basis. Thank you, Uncle Wayne. Um, so I've got a question in terms of for all the... Um, panel members and, and maybe um, from the audience as well and it's been a while since I've lived in Toowoomba but um, is there anything that the Toowoomba region does that supports the engagement or better supports the engagement of our older uh, citizens being more connected with the community and and um, and um, yeah and, and the broader um, you know, systems and support network out there from your perspectives or anything that it can do as well? I, um, the first thing that sprung to my mind, I used to work at TASC 
um, the Toowoomba Older Men's Network, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that they're right next door to TASC. I mean, I think TASC is a brilliant idea, Absolutely. brilliant workers. Um, uh, you know, the fact that they not only provide legal advice, but they also provide um, assistance for those in need, um, as, as well as their legal advice. And then you have the Older Men's Network there now, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything about, for mm -hmm. the women, and I'm happy to be told different, would love to know different. So I think that that, you know, it, it's kind of like they're just in the right spot, um, working cohesively with one another. My comment would be there are many Toowoombas, right? That's what it is. It's, it's not a city when you come to actually deal with people. It, it's groups of people and it's flexible. It, for our model, moving from the west, especially the Western Corridor, and the Gamilaroi coming from, from the south, more than 60% of the Aboriginal people here are not from Queensland, to use that 1859 border as a definition. They're, 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 there's many more Gamilaroi than there are others, and you know, your service deals with that. What I would say is it's exceptionally important to look at all the different ways, and, and that, I've been to East Creek where they've, they've been talking and not talked about some things. And it's great to do that, and you meet people who are like, oh, this is a terrible circumstance. The other thing I think that's important is the social working through the hospitals. When people come and they get a cancer diagnosis, for example, and they're sitting there, and uh, I've been through some of those with hospital support, and then they're told, oh, geez, this is not looking good. Uh, you've got six months. Uh, you know, you're, you're in this month or whatever, and your Gleason score is whatever. And then the next thing is, um, have you got a will? Uh, okay, and then they'll burst into tears. Have you, you know, have you thought, and it's not about the death notice as such, if I can be that you know, you know, curt about it. It's really about, well, what do I do? Who looks after the grandkids? Because they depend on me for money. They depend on me for support. They depend on me to visit. I look after them because those guys go out drinking or go out west. They go pig shooting, and they left the kids with me for three months. You know, it's that sort of stuff that, that I that I see. So, working with the social worker support, I don't know the exact titles within the hospital, the nice and Vincent's and others. You know, what happens is this, but it's a very significant group to work with. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the floor? Um, so, uh, can I just again thank the speakers, thank you for your sharing your wisdom, your insights and, and thank you to all of, uh, all of you for attending. Uh, this issue is really important. Um, I think the statistics reveal it and I think 
The statistics also don't indicate that there are there is significant underreporting in this area, and I think that um, that uh, as guardians, as uh, support and protectors uh, of those experiencing vulnerability, and as organisations uh, promoting the interests, choice, and rights of Queenslanders, um, we all have a role to play. Um, so I encourage all of you, as uh, you return to your roles, uh, to take uh, uh, with you the wisdom about. Uh, uh, the, that our speakers shared with you today and, uh, and continue that uh, commitment to protecting um, all individuals, including our uh, older citizens. Um, so this, we hope that this uh, forum is uh, the beginning of a collaborative community. Please, we encourage you to talk, network, find opportunities of how we can better connect together and better work together. Because I think it's through that, uh, through talking about it, and through uh, applying the insights we gained today and, and the research that uh, we can continue to make um, um, uh, you know, dense in relation to this very complex issue. So I look forward to our continued partnerships. Thank you for attending. We've got some, uh, uh, some nibblies afterwards. Please stay and join us for a discussion and thank you very much for coming. Thank you everyone.